All right, preparing live stream. It's it's happening. So welcome everyone to another installment of MSP webinars. I'm Steve, your host. Uh, today we've got some panelists uh, who I'm uh, I'm very excited to introduce to you guys. We have uh, Mike Clark, we have Zach Johnson, and we may or may not have Quentin Comer. Uh, all three of these guys are. Uh, Oh yeah, you're 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 on there, man. You 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 got you got stuck in this. Um, we we probably won't have quitting. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk virtualization today. Um, I I think I think what we are going to do is just kind of dive right in. Uh, Mike, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, just kind of like a mile high overview of of how much you use virtualization in in today? Oh, sure. Uh, well, first of all, how's the uh, mic coming through? Is it clear? You sound great. Okay, wonderful, because I just hooked it up about 10 minutes ago. Um, yeah, so my name's Mike. You guys know me from the uh, MSP chat, SS Mike. Um, Virtualization, we use it every single day. Uh, we no longer install physical servers unless there is some dire requirement, uh, which to date, we haven't seen very often. Uh, usually it's vendors that don't know what they're talking about. Um, but uh, even database servers, SQL servers, uh, we still virtualize that these days. Um, we run our RMM tool is on a virtualized SQL. Um, yeah, so I've been dealing with virtualizations. Ooh, let's see, I started with ESX, um, however many years ago that was, uh, whenever four was around. Um, then we moved into Hyper-V just because when 2012 Hyper-V came out, it just blew up, you know. Uh, the cost benefit was just there. Um, our low-end customers that just were getting a new server, you know, we just threw a VM on there instead of dealing with driver issues and and just to make things easier for everybody but the, the biggest benefit obviously is most of you guys are going to know is just reboots um it, it's almost instantaneous it's just worth it um i did see one q a question here vmware versus hyper v Depends we're not on. we're not going there yet <laughs> uh, okay. i wanted to answer that one kind of early it, 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 just like anything osc versus Linux. coke Windows, it all depends on the situation, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like VMware. Uh, you know, I've got my VMware binder. Um, but as general use, we go with uh, Hyper-V these days. It's just uh, just a matter of what the, uh, the circumstances call for. But I've been doing this for, oh, over a decade now. Uh, done some presentations for VMware over the years on virtual desktops, uh, VDI, when View 4.1 came out with PCOIP. Uh, yeah, so I've been dealing with this a long time. Uh, IT service manager for an MSP. A lot of MSPs are going to be watching this. So I do a lot of what you guys do. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Zach, you don't, you don't have a camera, do you, Zach? I do not. It's okay. We'll, we'll make it work. Zach, if you could please uh, introduce yourself and talk to us a little about how you use virtualization today. Well, I'm Zach Johnson. I've been in IT in one form or another for about 17 years. And I actually started with virtualization back when uh, Zen and uh, Virtual PC first came out and like, God, what was that, like 2004? That was a long time ago. But uh, as far as where I use virtualization, I'm much like Mike, anywhere and everywhere, all the time. Like, I don't, I don't do physical anymore unless there's a dire need, and, you know, that need is very, very rare. And... Uh, but uh, yeah, I've done a lot of you know BDI, RDS clusters, uh, application delivery. Um, I did PCO PCOIP like back when the the correct way to do that was to have a farm of desktops in a warehouse and <laughs> broker remote desktop sessions to that. So that was a long time ago. <laughs> but yeah, I've been doing it a long time and. Uh, 
I'm pretty good at it, I think. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Quentin, I know, I know you got roped into this at the literal last minute. W would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> oh, that's what it is. It's his, it's his microphone, I think. Yeah, so Quentin, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but you sound like a chipmunk. He does. That's just the way I sound. <laughs> is that better? That is extremely better. <laughs> so, um, Director of Technology, we are, uh, uh, I work similar to Mike for a copier dealership. Uh, multiple branches, and I oversee our technology division. We have um, kind of three distinct offerings as far as technology goes, and managed IT is one of them. Um, so I've been in and out of the managed services industry quite a few times, keep jumping back and forth between enterprise and service provider, and then enterprise and then service provider again. Um, been using virtualization since like VMware 2. I think that was the very first time I started working with it. And uh, <clears throat> that was back when nobody trusted it. So <laughs> like uh, it, it wasn't really, it didn't really catch on yet, you know? Huh. And so we started playing with it back then. And then obviously throughout the years started progressing more and more with it. And uh, I've managed both VMware and Hyper-V, um, large VMware farms, you know, with uh, <clears throat> 50, 60 hosts and hundreds and hundreds of VMs servicing both uh, internal infrastructure and rented or, or sourced infrastructure to, um, this was when I was in, in education, we actually resold the services um, and the VMs to other school districts uh, for hosting their infrastructure. And, um, you know, obviously smaller farms internally and in the managed services space, and then uh, Hyper-V, both in enterprise and, um, uh, managed services industry and just consulting gigs too and um, used uh, VDI on both um, virtualization for the infrastructure on both uh, SC VMM which is system centers enterprise management for um, Hyper-V virtualization and then obviously the VMware and vSphere infrastructure too hmm. cool um, and and I just want to I just want to vouch for Mike and Quentin uh, even though they are working at copier companies that also do IT, uh, these guys these guys truly do know their stuff. Um, I've had the privilege of of having conversations with these guys for has it has it been a year now? I feel like it's been a while by now since and, the chat uh, started. That was like last April. I try and block yeah. it out. Yeah, he, <laughs> they they try to forget me as as much as possible because I I. Uh, like to get myself in situations where everyone just likes to pick on me, but uh, it, it's all love. I know it. So, so I want to, uh, I just want to dive right in. Um, it, it sounds like uh, you guys all have just mo mostly decided that there's no, when do I virtualize? It's I virtualize and that's, that's just it. If you've got servers, they will be virtual servers. There's going to be a host somewhere, but everything else is going to be virtualized. Yeah, even Correct. single server installs are, are virtual. Yep. Yep. Same okay. here. Single server, uh, virtualize it and run it that way. Yeah, and the benefits to it just, they, they outweigh all the cons. You know, uh, you're essentially making your server portable. Uh, mm -hmm. Backups are so much easier. And dead. faster. Yeah, that, that as well. And like, you know, who doesn't absolutely love the fact that you can take a snapshot and then try some crazy stuff to troubleshoot? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as long we, as it's we, not a domain controller in a multi uh, DC environment. Right. Yes. Uh, uh, just, <laughs> that, that's a very good point. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just like, hey, that application server is acting up. We have no idea what we're doing. Snapshot, go poke at it. 
Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. Now, now I, I have an MSP. However, mine is smaller and my, my server environments are typically like five and less. Um, most of my server environments are like a one or two server environment. But even then, I, I do the same thing. I virtualize. And the, the fact remains that it is easier to manage a virtual environment. Uh, one, if you have to do a server reboot, that thing boots up a heck of a lot quicker than waiting on, you know, your, your nice big Dell power edge or whatever uh, to, to boot up. Um, and having no idea if it's demanding that you hit F11 for whatever. Exactly. And wait half an hour. And yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and you two, have to deal with remote access cards in a lot fewer instances now. Mm -hmm. And, and two, you know, another great point is, uh, backups are tremendously easier with tools like Veeam and Otaro and Dato and everything else that's out there. Uh, but the thing that I like the most about being virtual is um, typically my, my hardware has, has almost been kind of over provisioned, if you will. So if I know I need 16 gigs of RAM, I'll, I'll have 32 in the host just in case or whatever, you know? So for me, I just provision a little extra if, if something's acting goofy and, you know, we don't have to open up the case and actually physically install stuff because it's already in there. So, you know, it's, it's just the dumb little things that, that make virtualizing uh, so much more convenient for us as IT administrators. However, the, the interesting thing I've, I've never been able to figure out is when do you use VMware versus Hyper-V? Because I feel like VMware has a lot of really cool and powerful tools that Hyper-V either doesn't or doesn't advertise very well. So a lot of those features that, that you're talking about, Hyper-V has most of them. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not you use um, System Center in conjunction with it. If you're just talking about a standalone host or a standalone hypervisor, yeah, they're about the same. Um, actually, as far as backing up, uh, if you use ESX, you have to use the paid version, otherwise you don't get access to the API. Um, whereas Hyper-V, it's a little more common, uh, or rather it's easier to do. Um, we deal with that because we use SolarWinds backup. Um, and the only customers that we can back up if they're using uh, VMware is the ones that have the full paid version. Um, whereas our standard small server installs, which we did one not too long ago, uh, application server, single application uh, or single server environment, we just went with Hyper-V because we can just back it up easily. Um, now, one of the features that I like, and I haven't, I, I will admit, I haven't gotten totally up to date with uh, vSphere's capabilities, but one of the ones that I just found out about not too long ago is Hyper-V has shared nothing live migration. And I actually had the chance to test that out and it is beautiful. If you don't have a full, um, highly available fault tolerant solution in place, uh, you don't have to have a dedicated uh, VLAN for your uh, your live migrations or anything like that. You just have two Hyper-V hosts. You take the VM from one, you have to enable replication, but you, uh, you can just dump it onto the other one. You move the entire virtual disk, the entire virtual machine, maybe half a second of downtime, but I had a live connection up to it and uh, watched it migrate from one host to another and there was no delay. Actually uh, really another well. thing to point out that uh, that shared nothing uh, live migration, uh, you can also do shared nothing replica for poor man's HA. So you can have two hosts with no shared storage set up the replica and set the interval to as low as five minutes. So it's basically doing a live migration every five minutes. You'll want 10 gigabit between the hosts, by the way. Uh, but if you have a really low budget client and you want solid uptime without spending a lot of money, that is a good way to do it. You want to be careful about domain controllers and that, um, but it is a great cost effective option. That's awesome. yeah. Just as the, the basis for anybody that doesn't know that, don't replicate, don't restore, uh, you can snapshot domain controllers, but from an Active Directory perspective, uh, you don't restore domain controllers. It's easier to rebuild 
a domain controller in a multi DC environment than it is to uh, try to restore one and have replication break. Right, exactly. Why? Which is why, in best practice, when you're doing the poor man's HA with replica, two DCs, one on each host. Mm -hmm. That's the way you do that. That's that's an excellent practice. Now we we do have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> Now, Andy asked two questions, and I'm going to ask them backwards. What is your migration path after sales? And Andy, you might need to elaborate on that some. Yeah. I, I think I have an idea of what he's... So for us personally, um, it goes back to a little bit picking which hypervisor where. For us specifically on our, on our managed services side, it's always Hyper-B. Um, if you're a managed service customer, you're getting Hyper-V. Um, enterprise implementations, where we're acting as a VAR or professional services or reseller, you might examine the environment and evaluate what is the best solution for their environment. Um, but uh, um, it might be VMware sometimes. So I'm a little different than some other folks. I, I don't necessarily pitch both. It really, or either one or the other, it depends on the environment. But for managed services specifically, it's always Hyper-V. Uh, the reason is because of our backup solutions and our disaster recovery and continuity. Uh, we use Veeam, so it makes it really easy. I can put a Windows um, server in there as the BDR appliance, run Hyper-V on it, have it be the storage repo as well, and I can fill right over to that device. So um, if you're running VMware as your hypervisor, you can't do that. You need a proxy in order to do that. So you need twice as much hardware if you're trying to attempt to do the same thing with VMware. Um, and so to answer Andy's question is a little bit, um, during onboarding, there's nothing to pitch to the customer. We virtualize them automatically. We don't, we don't support physical servers for our managed service customers. Um, during the onboarding process, essentially what we'll do is we'll come in and we will actually bring our BDR appliance in. That's the very first thing we do before we touch anything. We bring in our appliance, start backing up to it, and we can actually schedule a period of time where we fail them over to that backed up VM and start using that while we rebuild their host, their, their production hardware. And then we'll fail them back over on their production hardware with that VM. So we always virtualize during onboarding. It's not an option. It's not a discussion. It's not something we pitch to them. It's part of our onboarding. Excellent. Um, so... <clears throat> What what is the the process I, timeline you take to migrate to virtual? So it sounds like I kind of wanted that... to pick up a point on his Hyper V only for managed services. Mm -hmm. We're the same way. Managed services gets Hyper V, and there's a sp specific strategic reason that I chose to do that, um, and that is <clears throat> if you look at the salaries of techs that know how to do stuff, a sysadmin. Uh, tier two or tier three that knows how to work with Hyper-V costs about 40% less than uh, a VMware expert. And so, so there's, there's some strategic value in using something that is as simplified and dummied down uh, and is well documented with TechNet and all of that uh, as Hyper-V. So are you saying that you're being cheap? I'm being strategic. <laughs> we're providing solutions that we can easily support. Yes. Right? We're, we're, still, we're selling an Absolutely. expectation to a customer is what mm. you're selling. You're selling an expectation and a service. So the, the best way, if, if you can learn Active Directory, group policy, exchange, things like that, assimilating them into a hypervisor that's formed around Windows is much easier. So, um, Zach, uh, when, when it comes to, you know, you, you pitch a new on a, a, a new MSP client, they have physical computers. Um, what does that look like for you? I mean, does it just, you, you switch them to virtual and that's that under discussion? Yep. And when does that Pretty happen much. and how does that happen? Is, is it like identical to Quinton or do you operate a little it's, differently? It's very, very similar. I mean, like I use uh, both Veeam and SolarWinds backup depending on scale and fit. 
Uh, but we'll go in and like pull it back up from the physical server and then I'll restore it to my Hyper-V host and then we'll do a controlled failover and run into production. So very similar to what, what uh, Quentin said. Um, I don't do BDRs unless there's like the expectation that they want high uptime. I'll do a NAS on site and then be able to restore an image and VM from that. Uh, but that's, you know, again, a strategic decision on my part. I'm starting to understand when you use that word strategic, what you really mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like uh, this, this one guy local here. He never says I run into a, I've run into a problem. He always says, I have a new opportunity today. <laughs> and it's just well, i love that positive spin <laughs> in our previous conversations i told you about my margins so <laughs> yes this is true um all right mike how about you uh i guess the same question so we don't enforce uh moving to virtual platforms um mostly because a lot of the clients that we take on are older nonprofit, um, their hardware may not necessarily support virtualization. We've actually run into a couple where there's been some old servers um, where they may have uh, VT or they may not. Um, and I'm not dealing with any kind of virtualization on a platform or a processor that doesn't have VT. Um, but- it just sounds like a bad idea. Yeah. So what we end up doing is most of the time there's an onboarding project involved and the reason that we're brought in is because things are out of date. So usually in those situations, we're spinning up new servers anyway. So those are gonna be virtualized, um, but we don't necessarily go through the uh, uh, physical to virtual migration very often. And not to say it hasn't been done, but it's a little more rare. Um, but uh, touching on the, the same side with the BDR, we don't enforce a BDR at all of our customers. Um, we do have the ability to bring those up in our data center uh, since we host our own backup uh, storage nodes for SolarWinds and we have our own hosts in our data center. We can actually spin them up in our colo as opposed to having a BDR on site. Um, so I just wanted to throw you a little bit of a comparison to how you know, three different MSPs operate. So I think uh, we're, we're pretty similar. I, I suppose I, I went based on the premise that none of their hardware needs to be replaced during onboarding. That's just a standard onboarding procedure, but we're, we're pretty similar. We do an assessment before we ever propose a customer managed services. Um, we can't set an expectation and support something if we don't know what it is. And so um, we'll do similar to Mike. If uh, we go in and we do our assessment, we'll propose a remediation project first which might include hardware, new servers, things like that. And then as part of that process, they're already virtualized. So it's pretty, pretty, although it's, it's slightly different, it's almost exactly the same because we go into environments where the hardware is at that age, we're doing the remediation, we're not onboarding them. And I don't know about you guys, but we've been running into so many problems recently with onboarding new customers whose domains or servers are just in a disaster to begin with that we end up just essentially starting from scratch. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, been a lot of instances recently where we've taken on customers and we walk in and we find out that, you know, somebody's gone in on their domain controller, pointed their DNS to global and, uh, you know, it's a single DC environment. Sometimes we're able to bring it back, sometimes not dealing with a lot of tombstoned objects, stuff like that. So we deal with a lot of, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, ignored uh, infrastructures. And we end up going in there and cleaning a lot up. Yeah, I don't think that's too uncommon. We'll try and address minimal amounts during onboarding, cleaning up some, some group policies, maybe cleaning up some AD accounts, maybe some shares. But the second we're starting to invest time essentially rebuilding their implementation, it's a, it's a remediation. and. Yeah, sometimes rather than trying to go backwards and figure out what's not broken, it's easier to just start from scratch. Take good backups, always backups. Very first thing you do is backups, but uh, start sometimes start from scratch, and sometimes that might be on new hardware and infrastructure. So allow them to work on their current, 
you know, while you're putting together their new, and then you're good to go. Excellent. Now, so for for small environments, what is the lowest spec hardware you go for? Like, if we're talking one or two VMs. Um, so we we always go for uh, hardware that obviously Xeon processors. We don't do the GB rig stuff where you're running i7 quad core with VMs on it on a Dell workstation. I, I see that constantly. Um, we don't do that. We go in, it's Xeon hardware, you know, depending on their, their demands, if it's pretty small, you know, we can get away with a single processor, you know, most come standard average around eight cores. So you're good to go there. And we always split it out. So um, at a minimum, our customers always have two VMs. One is a domain controller, and one is, can be a file print server, or depending on the line of business application, file print line of business. But the second that line of business application starts to become a true line of business application, we split it out into its own server as well. We, we always have something that can support a minimum of two servers um, or two VMs and uh, RAID 6, <laughs> RAID 10. Parity <laughs> uh, RAID over two terabytes is just a bad idea. And, um, so, um, you know, we'll typically split it out and the host will get smaller drives, uh, maybe in a RAID 1, you know, for the host OS. And then the data stores will run in a RAID 10. Um, nothing smaller than, we usually go uh, nothing smaller than 15,000 RPM uh, SAS drives. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we kind of go from there. So we separate out the data store where we're going to be hosting the VMs and stuff separate from the drives that are running that uh, hypervisor. How, how about you, Mike? Do, do your like minimum uh, specs, so to, so to speak, differ? Similar uh, about uh, it's going to be at least a single core processor, uh, eight core, although I think with the new Dell lineup, they're bumping that up even higher. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have roughly 32 gigs of RAM minimum, although these days we're actually going for 64. Um, always do RAID 10, uh, unless it's some crazy large uh, storage thing, which that'll have a custom solution for it. Um, I, I was joking, but not joking about parity RAID uh, that large. I just don't like parity RAID these days. Um, uh, but yeah, you use? 10 or 15 K drives is our average, but if it's a very, very <clears throat> low budget customer, you know, we're not opposed to putting 7,200 RPM drives in there. Um, as long as it's you know, less than 10 users or so. Uh, right. And you set the expectation about how this is going to perform. Right. Exactly. Uh, you still get a lot of the benefits of, of it, even on 7,200 RPM drives, but uh, just not as much. And Zach, uh, any differences for you with hardware? Nope. Very similar. 32 gigs, single core, at least eight CPU, like, you know, or single socket, eight CPUs, uh, 32 gigs of RAM, and RAID 10, uh, 15,000 RPM. Sometimes SSDs, and and that that kind of helps us uh, lead into the next question. What are your thoughts on solid state drives and servers? Um, this person recently had a vendor say, "No, don't put solid states in their application server." I'd like to know the reasoning behind that. Agreed. I kind of would too. Um, I feel like SSDs are are just. I mean. I love them. As long as it's server quality. Yeah. Know, right. Going and buying like don't, a. Don't go buy SanDisk like desktop SSDs and slap them in a server. So, so we shouldn't get the uh, the OCZ. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever those are called now. Yeah. Now, um, you know, Samsung, uh, Intel, they both make very high quality. Uh, silver quality drives um, mm -hmm. 
know, I will say that Dell charges an arm and a leg for them. Um, I really don't think that their cost is associated, well, rather their uplift is worth it. Um, but there are cases where we've done it even recently, uh, where we've dropped solid states in application servers. We knew it was going to be running SQL. Um, we wanted the IOPS. So, yeah, why not? Uh, now, I will say that we didn't do pure solid state throughout the entire uh, server. We had uh, some spinning disks for data storage. Um, but yeah, the OS core applications, um, yeah, that's all running on solid states and we love it. Yeah, and I've been doing some, some stuff with NVMe for VDI, which performs very, very well for that purpose. Cool. What so have you been running? Run. I'm sorry? What have you been running? Uh, the Intel M NVMe drives. Like, uh, I got some of the smaller ones. We're labbing them out, and uh, they're basically a giant PCI Express card. You slap in there, and it's, you know, capable of, like, you know, 750,000 IOPS um, running Citrix Zen Desktop. Hmm. Okay. So we, um, you know, I don't, I don't put solid state drives in as a standard. I know a lot of folks are moving to that. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I think there's good future proofing behind it. Um, on the flip side, I also believe there's a cost to doing business and that needs to be um, communicated and educated to our customers. Um, too many times folks allow the customer to dictate the solution, whether it's based on price or whatever it might be. But so I kind of, you have to evaluate the scenario. We don't do solid state as a standard across servers unless there's a need for it. Uh, we'll typically go 15,000 RPM, like I said earlier, you know, SAS drives in a RAID 10. Um, but as environment scale or line of business application changes, your needs and expectations change. So it's, it's kind of based on the expectations and needs of the environment. You know, if we do have a high intensity line of business application, well, environments that are getting to that size they're probably not your typical single processor 32 gig of ram single host implementation you're probably looking at a DAS or san or you know something along those lines and then you're able to implement solutions like caching you know with ssd drives and things like that so the scale really changes but um so it's, it's kind of based on the environment we do have some customers where they they have a um, data store that's on SSD because of their line of business application and they actually only have three VMs. You know, they just happen to be a small environment that does a lot of transactions in business. Um, so not all environments are the same, but at the same token too, um, we go in with the solution that we feel is right and it's accurately sized and proposed for their environment. Um, whatever we determine that is based on the needs and expectations and that's what we propose to them. So there's, there's kind of two sides of it, you know? Right. And one thing to remember is that when you're specking this box for this virtualization, you're not specking for what they need right now. You're specking it for what they're going to need in five years when this thing is coming up for replacement. I feel an RMM discussion coming on based on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's, yeah. You don't order for what they have now. What they have now, you're replacing you yeah, because I've, I've, you know, had, you know, sales meetings with a lot of clients and they're like, okay, like we want a new server. And I'm like, okay, what do you need now? And I'm like, okay, what are you, what are your growth projections over the next five years? And they're like, oh, well in five years, we plan on having, you know, 14 more employees. And so that's going to change, you know, what I'm going to spec because I got to support this thing, you know, for the next five years. And when they, double or triple the workload on it, you know, that's going to change what I'm going to spec. Yeah. It's all about so, expectations. It, it's, it's, it's all about what we're proposing and how it fits into their business and helps their business achieve their goals. You know, they tell us that piece, what their goals are, how their business operates, what their expectations are. And we develop the solution for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, somebody asked, um, 
They, they said the line between consumer and commercial SSD seems to be a gray area. Would you consider Samsung 850s to be consumer? And I personally would absolutely say yes. Um, and, and not only would I say yes, but I would say that uh, Samsung has a line specifically for servers, and that's like the PM series or the SM series of, uh, of solid state drives. Your thoughts, guys? Really, a gray area. It's pretty black and white. There are those drives or their consumer drives. And if you look up the Samsung website, 850 Pro, the very first thing it says is that it's a consumer drive. Mm. Right, right yeah, you, there on the website. Yeah, on, on the Samsung website, when you look at flash storage, there's client SSD and there's enterprise SSD. Um, it's, it's pretty cut and dry in my opinion that um you, you really you really need to be on on enterprise ssd and that's that's not just a function of performance either like i i think that's what he was getting at is that the performance of the 850 pro consumer drive compared to the pm or sm series it's like yeah they perform similarly they, they do but the failure rate is going to be different right exactly. and the reliability that's actually not the biggest difference. Um, the biggest difference between consumer and commercial grade drives is onboard capacitors. Um, yes. Your consumer uh -huh. drives do not have them. They are liable to data loss in the event of loss of power. That's right. Uh, commercial exactly. Drives. Yeah, that's, and there's also some firmware functionality in the enterprise drives that is available to like storage subsystems and things like that, that is pretty important as well. Right. And there's also uh, SLC versus MLC versus TLC. Uh, your single layer, uh, uh, come on, brain, single layer cell. Um, basically, when it came to uh, your server uh, SSDs, you always wanted SLC or EMLC. Uh, then it became that you would want um, MLC and TLC was not allowed. And then Dell started talking about. Uh, uh, supporting trim and all of these other things, but it's still yeah. just not a good idea to put consumer grade drives into commercial environments. That's absolutely um, true. And even when you look at the Dell SSDs, most of those are Intel or Samsung rebranded enterprise drives. Yep. So let's talk about, let's, let's go down a few rungs on the ladder because I feel like we're talking uh, very high level stuff right now. And you never know, we, we want to appeal to, to all of the audiences. So, so let's talk uh, some best practices. How do you determine what specs you need for an environment? And I'm not talking for a small environment for a big environment. How do you, how do you calculate uh, how much RAM, how many CPUs, how much disk space that you need for a virtual environment? So your disk space, um, that should be done during your assessment and evaluation. You should know how much data they have, how much they house. Um, your domain controller, DNS, file, print servers, those are fairly standard. Um, most of them only need one VCP or one gigs of RAM, uh, unless you're doing anything crazy with uh, FSRM, in which case you want to throw a little more memory at it. Uh, it kind of comes down to the amount of users, type of line of business applications, uh, and you also have a, a bunch of factors to take into account. Um, but if it's a 20 user environment, it's really not that different from 100 user environment. Um, it's just a matter of scale. Um, you have to start looking into uh, redundancy. You have to start to look into the cost to the business. Um, you know, in, in a 10 person environment, uh, the server being down for 30 minutes, eh, well, it's a problem, but you know, it's not going to kill them. Right. hundred users, on the other hand, you can monetize how much they're losing. Uh, and they're more often than not, as long as they take their technology seriously, they're willing to put the money into the infrastructure to, mm -hmm. uh, to not happen. Uh, yeah, it's just kind of an example of that mon that monetizing the loss. Uh, at in one of my big enterprise jobs in my past, um, it was for call centers, and they track everything down to the minute. So they knew that an outage 
cost them around $4,700 a minute for downtime. So That is absolutely was, nuts. So when stuff was down, it was a big deal. <laughs> that is absolutely nuts. Nuts. Um, so, and that's when you go in and you can say, well, you know, we've got this great BDR solution and, and that, that comes to be a, a, a nice new sales pitch for them. Um, right. And that, that segues it nicely into the Hyper-V versus VMware discussion. Uh, because if you've got a client that like absolutely cannot tolerate any downtime ever, um, you know, going with, you know, VMware enterprise features with like FT and like, you know, instant failover, um, you know, bringing Veeam into the picture for like rapid disaster recovery and things like that. Like, you know, th that's where those types of conditions lead to exploring options like that, that have, you know, extremely high cost to them. Excellent. Now, <clears throat> how do you guys determine when you want to be in-house versus using a data center? Oh, actually, wait, I'm sorry. Um, I see a question in the chat. Zach, how did they come to that number of, of 4,700 a minute? So in big call center environments, they track everything. Um, every task, every call, uh, they break down the call into um, different portions of it. So like the greeting, the, the work done after call work, uh, idle time between calls, um, and in, when you're outsourcing for like very large companies, usually um, the billing works out to like availability of agents in seats per minute. Um, so there's your op minute, minute opportunity cost. Um, you know, the, 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 the financial analysts like have broken down, you know, the wage cost and, you know, figured out the minutes for that. Uh, there's a lot of math. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, they, they took all of that big analytical data that they had and combined it together and could come up with uh, a lost revenue to wage and, and lost opportunity cost. That's very cool. That's very cool. So now we'll, now we'll go back to uh, the other question. When, when do you determine when you want to be virtualized in-house versus using a data center and that could be a local data center where you are uh, uh, co-locating some hardware or you could even be talking about azure or amazon or whatever i guess i'll take that one um so it all comes down again to cost to the business um you know, we recently decided instead of building out a data center here in our headquarters office, we decided to just go ahead and go with uh, a local company. Um, you know, the cost for us to build out redundant HVAC, redundant uh, ISPs, uh, um, redundant power, all of it, it just wasn't worth it. Um, you know, we, we did the math on it and it came out to be very high uh, and it just wasn't worth it for us. Um, so it all depends on the needs of the customer. Um, if they are a type of organization that is majority in one building, they could actually benefit from having that in-house because then you don't have all of the issues of um, uh, internet connectivity, uh, routing issues, all of the, the crazy stuff that comes around if they just need to be able to access their line of business application on their virtual machines. Um, but in the instances of, um, dispersed companies, companies have multiple offices, uh, which is something that we're going through because we've acquired two companies this year um, that you, you just have to weigh the, the impact of business in the cases of if a site or an entire company goes offline. Um, you know, for us, uh, if we were to put, uh, well, here, let me let me throw a customer out there. Uh, we have a customer, it's 200 and, I don't know, 250, 300 users. Um, but the majority of them are in their headquarters office. For them, the applications that they used, uh, it made sense for them to have most of their equipment uh, in their headquarters office. Um, as they've started to move to more cloud services, their branches have started to open up. They're using a lot more um, 
basically internet connection as opposed to servers and headquarters. Uh, and it just makes sense for them to start to get that stuff out of headquarters, uh, start to put it out more because as they branch out further and further across the US or across the world, um, it just doesn't make sense to keep it in house anymore. Um, now, whether they want to keep that private or go public, in my opinion, Azure, uh, AWS, a lot of that stuff, you only do that if you need truly, truly highly available things. Um, in our case, we do, um, uh, we're under an NDA, so I can't really talk about it, but we do something for a lot of companies all across the US. Um, and it's something that needs to be highly available. Uh, instead of putting that on our servers in our data center, we went with AWS. Uh, but for our other line of business stuff, we have that in our data center. Well, I say our data center, but the rack that we lease. Sure. Um, you know, it, it all just, uh, it really comes down to needs. But Zach, do you have anything to add on that? I was going to say, I'll, I can speak, wanted to speak a little bit about public cloud versus, you know, dedicated private cloud or even just dedicated hosting. Like I make a very clear distinctions between uh, dedicated servers and dedicated virtualization and private cloud and public cloud. Uh, so to me, uh, cloud is about uh, orchestration. And um, there's, an, there's a, a great analogy that's thrown around a lot talking about workloads and are your workloads pets or are they cattle? And so the analogy is that uh, a pet, when it gets sick, you take it to the vet and you fix it. Um, but if you have cattle and a cow gets sick, you drag it out back and you shoot it. Um, so You're not like, a nice person. <laughs> well, it's it's an apt analogy because that does work in agriculture. That's what they do with like sick cattle at, at that scale. It costs them less to just cull. And so, so if you if you take that a concept and, and apply it to line of business applications, or you know, you know, in this case, service delivery, um, you know, you, you construct your infrastructure uh, and workloads in such a way that they're elastic, and individual components of that infrastructure can be discarded as needed, uh, you know, above a certain threshold. So, you know, that's why you know. Amazon and Azure like have all these different component services like you know database is separate from compute which is separate from storage which is you know separate from you know different tiers of storage and so like you can build out your workloads so that um, let's say you've got a, a SaaS app that has this cattle like workloads and you know you get a log on storm you know it's 8 a.m. everybody's logging in well your your servers are getting overwhelmed and so your application performance monitoring should see that and then start triggering orchestrated scripts that spin up additional load balancers additional compute nodes um and start you know balancing all those logons across more servers and then it handles it and then when that's done and everybody's in and you don't need that you know extra uh, extra resources, it scales it back down. <laughs> and that's the, the big impetus behind all these public cloud vendors doing like hourly or in some cases minute um, uh, billing increments. Uh, because sometimes you just need a bunch more stuff for like 30 minutes and then it goes away. You know, those cattle are, are taken out back and shot. Uh, so that's that's where I kind of draw the line in like, does this need to be, are, you know, are these pet workloads or are these cattle workloads? And, you know, is there a discussion about, should we convert these to cattle workloads? Does that make sense? You know, that kind of discussion. Interesting. Quentin, do you have anything that you'd like to add? You're muted. Oh, there we go. I said I, I missed ninety percent of that, except for killing cattle and pets. So, he doesn't kill the pets; he loves the pets. Yes. Uh, got it. So, so we were we were talking about when when do you 
when do you use in-house versus uh, a, an outsourced solution, whether it's a um, rack that you lease somewhere else or Azure, AWS, whatever? Uh, like internally or customers directly or? For customers. <laughs> Should I just go op- over the whole thing again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you start over, please? Uh, you know, it, it, it really depends. It depends on um, expectations. Uh, deliverability of that service, and um, ultimately, potentially, depending on how they're spread out, if they're multi-branches, you know, things like that. Um, personally, I, I like to leverage the cloud if we can. Um, you know, we, we use Azure. Um, I post about it regularly in Discord. Um, I have some customers where we go in and it's, it's not an advantageous situation to slump a bunch of hardware in there um, because maybe they, they just don't need the hardware, you know, um, they need a domain and they need a few other things. And so we'll spin up a DC in Azure and do a site to site VPN with a failover LTE and include that in their managed service agreement and away we go. You know, it, it makes our sales track a lot easier, reduces the capital expenditures and uh, we still maintain our margin and our standards and the customer gets what they need as well. So it, it really kind of depends on, on the needs of the environment. Um, you know, uh, if it's a small, maybe it's a CPA firm or something like that and we can get away with, you know, they, they access QuickBooks, they access like two or three applications. Uh, maybe they want to be able to access it remotely because they're out, you know, in our area, especially a lot of the CPA firms do auditing so they'll audit school districts and county offices and things like that. We'll start talking hosted RDS for them, you know, or, or whatever it might be. Um, then that way it's a lot more scalable. It's easier to support and maintain and it's a lot more scalable too. At that point, the desktops become a commodity. They're just slightly irrelevant. We just replace them if they fail. And depending on the size of the customer, if we're looking at something where we go with that across the board, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe we include some low cost desktops or something like that. You know, if my margins are so high on that account um, that a desktop dies and I can replace it with a $200 refurb or $250 refurb because the the desktop's just a um, gateway into their real environment, then I'm okay with that. But it it completely depends on the environment. You know, It's, it's really hard to determine without having an example in front of you, but CPAs is probably the easiest one tax offices, things like that. Most of those you could probably get away with moving over to a completely hosted environment. Um, I specifically have have one customer who does um, telemetry for agriculture. So essentially what they do is they go out and they install nodes and towers um, for the agriculture industry and they monitor, alert, and maintain crops for all their agriculture customers. Well, because of that, they have, they have no computers. Their entire workforce is farmers and ag, you know, the people who go out and install it and stuff like that. So they have maybe one desktop computer that they use in their office, but they have 30 employees, you know? <laughs> so their infrastructure, we have them completely in Azure. And um, they have two VMs, so they're looking at standing up an additional VM based on node counts every six to nine months. Um, there's, there's absolutely no reason for that to be on premise for them. It needs to be highly available. It needs to scale as they scale and uh, it needs to have processing power behind it. And so there's, there's no benefit in that scenario to bring that on premise. So uh, I'll pose a question for you then. Um, so since this is targeted mostly towards MSPs, um, <clears throat> what would you say your opinion is on uh, building out your own private cloud to sell to your customers versus just going and reselling Azure or AWS? I think there's pros and cons. Um, to some extent, I step back some days and I look at it and we have the hardware to build out Polo, you know, and get it in there. It's something else to manage. It's capital expenditures for us as hardware dies and becomes replaced and things like that. Um, it's a lot more, it, it provides certain flexibilities that Azure and other scenarios don't, you know, because it's essentially 100% manageable and scalable by us. 
We're not relying on Azure as API or infrastructure or things like that. On the flip side, there's certain scenarios where Azure is far more dynamic than anything I could ever provide. Um, you know, and scalable and their API is accessible and completely published. And um, for me personally, every time I come back to look at building out a colo or something for us, I can't find a good reason that I need to have absolutely jumped on it yesterday. There's a lot of it, there's a lot of things where it would benefit, you know, as I'm thinking things that we're rolling out or, or situations that we could improve. Um, as far as our, our offerings right now and what we're looking to in the future, um, we probably will go with the colo, you know, and, and and do that and make that investment. But it's an investment, and it's not just an investment up front. It's an investment as you cycle hardware and replace it. It's an investment into um, technical resources to be able to manage it. There's a lot more when you look at total cost of ownerships, which by the way is the only conversation you should be having with customers is return on investment and total cost of ownership. You need to evaluate that internally as well. Um, it's a very good point. You know, I rather spend the time managing my customers' expectations and environments than my own. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm really happy with the service. I think it's very affordable through Azure, especially through the CSP program. Um, and it's, it's scalable. And, you know, I'm happy with it. So I can see us moving forward with it quite a bit. There, there are a lot of scenarios that, you know, I look at, so we use Veeam and we go to a managed backup portal in Azure and that's where we host our environment. And I look at it and so taking that, for example, if I were hosting that in a colo, I could always spin up the customer's VM as a nested VM on my management server where I control the resources. I don't have to go to Azure and expand my resources or try to scale out live. You know, I can do that in a colo easily, right? And I control it. All I got to do is right click new VM, set the resources on it, you know, and restore or fail over to that. And it's pretty easy. But I think you know, going back to that, that's a lot more to manage and maintain and licensing a track every month with SPLAs and things like that. Um, so I, I don't think everybody should be a, a, against Azure or AWS or anybody else for that matter right off the bat. You know, um, when it comes to competitors and other things like that, um, I can easily look at a lot of those and I can say uh, that my implementations are more secure than theirs just based on the facts alone not based on how we implemented it but the facts alone is their their information is going to be safer in azure than some hodgepodge solution provided by another managed service provider um you know you, you have a capability of uh we call it uh fud fear uncertainty and doubt you have the capability of dropping a lot of that in a sales um situation with the customer purely based on the fact that you're, you're using enterprise enterprise grade cloud. I mean, hell, if it's good enough for the Department of Defense, why isn't it good enough for my small business clients? So I actually did a, uh, a demo yesterday uh, since we were talking about uh, automated scaling and things like that. And um, I know you guys are going to go, ah, oh, he's a Kaseya nerd, but um, <laughs> I did a demo with uh, the product that they bought earlier this year called uh, Unigma. And one of the things that they were talking about was automated scaling of Azure AWS. Um, so they, they were actually walking me through some of their automated alerts and remediation for it. So they had um, an instance on Azure. It was a single CPU and they had an alert that said, oh, CPU is over 80% for however many seconds. And they scaled it up to a two uh, vCPU VM immediately. And I just thought that that was really, really neat. And it has a lot of different uh, pieces to it. But uh, since Zach was talking about the scaling side, that just uh, brought that to mind. Well, yeah. I mean, sure, you could potentially do that in your colo, assuming you have the hardware. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it. But when, in Azure, we can do it at any given time. The, the resources are infinite as far as we're concerned, you know, and I think that provides a lot of value to that conversation. I think 
Mm -hmm. When you're talking scalability, high availability, failover, things like that, um, for the price that you pay, um, I think there's a lot of value to a relationship with Azure or, or AWS or whomever, you know. Um, with that being said, too, we we monitor, script, and automate a lot of Azure-related stuff in lab tech. Um, so that's been a pretty big push for me is that um, as we're moving forward, we're trying to really step back from each situation and evaluate, do we need infrastructure for this? Does the customer need infrastructure? Um, can we come to a better value-based proposition by throwing them in Azure? So because of that, we started to evaluate our automation and capabilities with, with Azure, with lab tech scripting and you know stuff like that. So we're able to resize hard disks in Azure and connect to it with uh, Azure RM, which is a PowerShell modules and stuff like that, out of scripts in, in lab tech. I can spin up VMs running a script from lab tech. You know, so you could do the same by monitoring the resources, uh, no different than an on-premise VM, and monitor it and trigger autofix actions to trigger a, a script that instead calls Azure and scales that CPU or hard drive as you grow too, you know? I think the scalability is key. I, yeah. I think with that being said too, I, I don't, and I always make it very clear, I don't sell the cheapest offering. I don't. Um, and that, that tends to be the argument against Azure and things like that is, is the price for some folks. Um, I've got some customer, th this customer right now, um, you know, I, I won't go into pricing. We assume that everybody in here is, is an MSP, but you got to be careful too with it being on YouTube and stuff like that. Um, but we've got a customer where they gladly paid 10 times more to go to fully hosted infrastructure in Azure because of the benefits behind it. They asked if they could pay up front for the year. <laughs> and, and what benefits did you show them? Well, they fortunately for us, you know, sometimes your biggest sales advantage is your competition. So they were with our, they were with one of our competitors there. They had hosted VMs by them in a colo provided by that provider. Well, it was going down regularly, the specs, the speeds were slow, things like that. And, you know, they say, well, we look at our VM and it says it has two CPUs and eight gigs of RAM and 200 gigs of hard drive space, but you, they don't know what's underlying on the host that that provider is using, you know? So they were constantly going down. They were having slowness issues. Their, their backups were questionable. They once had a, a opportunity that they needed to restore, you know, opportunity. They, didn't, they uh, had that opportunity that you were talking about earlier to restore and the provider didn't have it. So they lost six months of data. Um, and so they had situations where the power was going out. So the provider was borrowing a generator from them to power their, their data center. <laughs> so just absurd stuff. And so our value was that you need infrastructure that's available when you need it. We can provide that. What is, it's, what is it worth to you? What is the cost of downtime? What is the PR hit that when your customers that are paying you for your services are not able to access those services and then it costs them money? It, it snowballs and it goes downhill. To them, it was an easy solution. You know, it was an easy answer. And so that's why it's a whole different conversation. But when I talk about sales stuff, you're selling value to them. You're not selling a price point. Um, I make 73%, I'd have to look it up, but about 73% margins on that customer still after moving them to Azure. So you can still make money on it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people sell Datto, they still make money on it. You know, some of us, we argue that it's expensive. It reduces margins. It reduces whatever your reasons are. Many providers still sell it and they still make good money on it. It's all in about how you pitch uh, and propose the solution. And it won't fit for customers. And I'm okay with that. Because if a, if a customer doesn't want the proper solution that we recommend to them, maybe we're not the provider for them. So uh, going, going back to the scripting piece, Zach, I know that you love scripting. Um, what kind of things have you been able to script 
Zach using PowerShell for Azure? Well, I mean, like the 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 obvious one is like provisioning. Um, if we need to do an Azure Azure workload, like um, I've set up like basic forms that like I fill out, you know, customer name, location, you know, you know, I have several drop downs of like, okay, like what is this for? Um, is it a DC? Is it an application server? Um, and then when I submit that form, uh, it hits a uh, orchestration server, which fires off a series of scripts that auto provision like about what I'm about to deploy. And uh, that saves, you know, untold amounts of time. You know, that's just one example. Um, other examples are like um, I do uh, VMware as a service. So um, and I do that pretty cost effectively. Like as you know, I can do a 32 gig node um pair of clock like a pair of nodes with 32 gigs eight cores and uh 600 gigs of ssd accelerated uh 15,000 rpm sas data stores for less uh for less than what it costs to run a, a medium-sized application server in azure um, but the the real power there is is the vendor i use specifically has bare metal as a service that I can activate via API calls. So I can provision physical hardware uh, using scripts, which is downright amazing. So it's just like a customer, it's like, oh, well, like we want a bunch of VMs in the cloud. Um, if I, I can actually sit down and be like, all right, well, if it's like four or five VMs and I can give you a, just a dedicated cluster with VMware ESX, Enterprise with vCenter, Enterprise Plus, and NSX, um, I can fire off a script and then like have that permit provisioned in about 10 minutes, booted, ready to use. And then we have uh, a set of reverse proxies that present the vCenter instance to the end users and to our, our technicians. Um, so that, you know, like uh, one of the reasons we do that uh, is like you for clients that have an internal IT department, right? And they're like mid-level guys. Like they don't know what Azure is. They don't know how to use Azure, but they want to be able to manage their stuff. Uh, but they know how to ESXi with vCenter because, you know, they spun up the free version and they're screwing around with it and they like it. Uh, so like I give them a cluster and uh, a vCenter instance uh -huh that they just use like it's on-prem. Um, and that costs less, way less for me than doing it all in Azure. And it's something that they're familiar with. You know, and that's a use case type thing, but you know, that's you know, one of those ways that I use orchestration and, and uh, scripting. Excellent. Um, and I and I see that Quentin answered it privately, but I, I just want to to go back to Brian's question. Um, as someone with limited Azure experience, how does pricing compare to on-site solutions? Um, and and I think you know you you hit the nail on the head, Quentin. They're they're not comparable one bit. I mean, yeah, you you could compare the pricing, but they are two completely different beasts. You know, there, there are completely different reasons to go uh, fully hosted versus on site. Um, if you look at just hardware versus the cost per hour or whatever, um, Azure might end up costing you less, but now you have to worry about um, redundant internet and all that other expensive stuff that goes with having something hosted elsewhere. So that way people can continue to access it 24 seven. Am I, am I missing the point there, Quentin? No, no, that's it's it's a completely different sale. You, you can't compare on premise to cloud, whether it's uh, whatever you want to call it, private cloud or or public cloud, Azure, your colo. They're not a comparable sales discussion. Um, in fact, oftentimes you should not provide 
both options as a comparative solution to the customer. You know, you need to evaluate which one is the right one and talk to them about that. And if that doesn't work, maybe fall back to the other, right? Maybe if uh, cloud hosted isn't the right solution or maybe you feel that it is right, it's just not gonna work out in the cards for them, then maybe you can say, well, why don't we look at redoing this with on-premise infrastructure, you know? You're gonna see you're gonna see ups and downs. You're gonna see some areas where one might cost more than the other, short term, long term. You're gonna see one where the other one in the same proposal, certain certain pieces of it are gonna cost more or less. So it's a completely different sale. You know, it's like going to buy a car. If you go to buy a car and your requirements are low, right? I just need a car with four seats. Well. <laughs> You know, a sales rep might look at you and he might say, well, you know, you need this BMW and, and you might need this, this Honda Civic. Well, you need to filter and evaluate the expectations and needs a little bit more um, to make sure it's the, right, it's the right solution and you focus your sales track on that solution. Yeah, about the only time you really compare them mm -hmm. is if you have sufficient data to do a TCO analysis. Right. Yep. Yep. TCO, ROI, looking at that, you know, we, we, we try to make it easy to do business with. So in certain scenarios where uh, um, operational expenditure versus a capital expenditure is more advantageous for the customer or easier pill for them to swallow, we'll then evaluate, do they still need on-premise or do they need cloud? If they need on-premise, we'll work out a leasing or financing situation um, through our, our leasing partners. Um, or we'll, we'll pitch Azure if that's the right solution as well. So that's what I mean. There's so, so many different aspects to that, that they're not apples to apples. And, and you know, that, that's one thing I, I didn't even think to say, you know, CapEx versus OpEx is, is sometimes, you know, an easy decision for a company to make. Uh, sometimes they don't care. Sometimes it's a matter of you got the, the deal and you didn't, you know? <laughs> and so if you guys don't know about it, actually, I just had a good conversation with Great America Leasing today. We're a huge Great America partner. I mean, purely because of our relationship on the copier side, but we're a, we're a, <laughs> Mike shakes his head, he knows. I mean, you're talking, you know, millions a year in financing through Great America. So we have very good standing with them and uh, they're great partners of ours. Um, they have integrations with ConnectWise. Um, with PSAs and what they'll actually do, a lot of people don't understand. A lot of times, even though you pay one invoice on the copier side to the leasing agency, the cost per click is a pass through to the dealer. So it's, it's advantageous for the customer because it's one bill. They pay one company and then essentially Great America or whoever the leasee, leaser is takes that money and it's a pass through straight to the dealer. So that rate's negotiated with the dealer. On the IT side, it's the same. So I had a good conversation with Great America today They'll do the same for um, hardware and service as a rental. They call it HAAR because it's still, it's essentially, it's still leased. Um, it's a lease agreement. It's a contractual obligation. And what they'll do is you can invoice the customer one invoice. Um, now in states like California, you know, we don't tax service unless it's tied to hardware or an implementation. So if I sell a server and professional services to implement that, I have to tax the whole thing. Um, if I am selling, uh, in this scenario, maybe we're, we're leasing them their infrastructure, but then also selling them managed services. Um, they're two different, we, we wanna separate them out as two different line items. Otherwise we have to tax the whole item as a, as a whole thing. Um, so what Great America will actually do, kind of getting to the point, is they'll allow you to lease the hardware and the customer pays the hardware lease and the managed services lease to Great America. And then the managed services is a pass through to the, to the provider. So that's all negotiated with you. That's all your managed service agreement, your terms and conditions, your contracts, but Great America will basically make it so you can go, hey customer, here's your one invoice for $2,000 a month. And they pay one company and then it comes through as a pass through. And the integration with ConnectWise will allow you to submit a credit application directly from an opportunity in ConnectWise, and then also track and control the invoices and payments um, from the customer to with Great America 
in ConnectWise. And if Great America doesn't receive a payment from the customer, it opens a service ticket in ConnectWise for you automatically on your sales board. Can, can I just say you are a fantastic ConnectWise salesperson? <laughs> Still not enough for me. Yeah. Um, all right. So this person is curious if anyone is using Chef or something similar to help manage infrastructures. It sounds like it's some combination of RMM plus PowerShell. Well, it's 100% RMM. It's just what scripting language or, or scripts you are invoking with your RMM. So for us, it's 100% RMM. So it doesn't sound like, it sounds like Chef is a third party tool. Chef's an automation asking. tool. Okay. Um, there actually is somebody in the channel that uses it. Um, I can't remember his name. Was it Jason? Um, he's yeah. actually out your way, Steve. Jason um, Slagle, wasn't it? Yeah, that sounds right. Um, and he uses it pretty heavily, but I can't say that I have any firsthand experience with it. Well, they're also an ISP. So they're a managed services is a small portion, smaller portion of their business. They're primarily a uh, service provider and you know as far as internet services so i know they use chef they might use ansible as well for automating stuff on that side too they're 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 quite unique though they're looking at what are they looking at uh um they're looking at moving their crm and stuff over to zoho one or whatever it is i think wasn't that jason or was that somebody else wow well, I, I think it may have been somebody else but yeah I think it depends on your needs. I, I think as a service provider, you need to be very careful and you need to select your stack and you need to be very selective about it and make sure it fits your needs. And um, because the whole premise is we can make situations that are repeatable very, very easily, right? We, we need to be able to just get in there and do it real quick. And so, um, Realistically, your RMM should be able to handle majority of it, whether they can call PowerShell or Bash or whatever scripting language you're using from directly within their scripting engine, or you're using it to trigger a script that's saved as a file somewhere. You know, maybe you're using it to call a Bash script remotely versus using Bash directly within the RMM scripting engine. But I, I at least for us, I, that's why even the Azure stuff, I, I try and trigger it out of lab tech and make sure all that's done in lab tech because that's what we work out of. Lab tech is our tool, you know? So even though it may not directly call something or manipulate something directly on the hardware or hardware in this case, um, it's our tool, it's what we use. Excellent. Um, Zach, anything you'd like to add to the automation portion? Uh, not really. I mean, just learn it. Things like uh, Chocolati, like are amazing for like workstation setup and stuff like that. I mean, you can use automation in a lot of places. Most people don't realize you can use it. I mean, like just, you know, the, the rule of thumb should be if you ever have to do anything more than once, automate it. Yes. Yep. I think it was... Um... Uh, who was it, Tom? I don't remember how to pronounce his last name, Limoncelli or something like that. Said, uh, never spend an hour doing what you can automate in a day. Yeah. So, might have, might have been somebody else. Based on that, uh, you know, I like the way you said that, chocolate. Uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out if it's Azure, Azure, or Azure. Sure. I like to call it chocolate lately. <laughs> uh, we, we use it too. Uh, a lot of our automation is built around it and we use our RMM to trigger and call those scripts. So we use, um, and I probably pronounce it wrong, but yeah, you know, like Mike's saying, I say chocolatey, that's probably wrong. I say Azure, but, uh, or Azure. Um, I mean, call Dado even, <laughs> you know, I brought up that neighbor. You'll hear three people from there even pronounce it different ways too, or, or you know, whatever company you're calling. Right, I've heard Dado more than once. Yeah, and so, Yep. Regardless, um, we use, and maybe wrong, I pronounce it chocolatey, um, very, very heavily because it's it's scalable and it's very dynamic. I know a lot of folks use Ninite and Ninite Solution. I think it's really, really good. I think it's a great offering if that fits for what you're trying to achieve. 
um, we use Chocolaty because I can do more than just third-party patching with it. I can do full spin-up of servers uh, between Chocolaty, uh, DSC, which is desired state configuration in PowerShell. If you don't know what that is, look it up. Um, so between those two and just the scripting engine within my R RMM, um, I can actually use my RMM to trigger all those other services as well. Um, we can achieve absurd amounts of automation. I mean, if I run into something one time, we, we try and automate it. You know, if it's something that was triggered because of an alarm or something like that, we figure out what to find or how we can find something to automatically, automatically trigger that automation or remediation. But your, your RMM really should be the heartbeat of your organization and your service delivery. That's, that's just me. That could be wrong, but you know, that's the way I feel about it. I want, I want my text trying to work out a one piece of the pie as much as possible. You know, I don't want them looking at four or five, six different interfaces and portals to achieve one thing. That's, that's not the objective of a managed service provider. You know, the objective of a managed service providers is being able to do it efficiently and do it quickly and do it proficiently as well, you know. And we do that by achieving those results with the tools that we have. And the other piece too is when you look at automation or scripting, there's no box. You can't be confined into a box when you're looking at that. You need to step back and look at the entire situation and think of how you can use your current stack to um, get to that point, whether you're calling those third-party services from within your tools or not, um, and really just eliminate the box because that's where you're going to see the best results. I, I see people look at a tool and they feel like, oh, I can only do this with this tool. It lacks this or it has this. Ultimately, most things, you can make them do what you want them to do. It's just a matter of how you execute that and achieve that. So that's going to be the biggest benefit is just stepping back away from that and using those tools. Right, Excellent. exactly. I mean, like, what makes more sense? taking a week to onboard a customer and just throw agents on everything and figure it out or take three months and set it up. So every time you slap an agent on a workstation, it automatically sets the workstation up without being touched. Excellent. Well, I think, uh, so somebody in discord brought up a good point. Um, you know, the other piece to that, which, uh, probably doesn't get touched on enough, but that's, that's our purpose too. It's done the same way every time. Um, you know, they mentioned that uh, consistency and accuracy. The second you invoke a human to do something, you're asking for problems and you're asking for errors. Um, if you can automate things and do it in a scripted and automatable manner, you know, or automated manner, I'm sorry, you, you result, you remove the probability of error. We're all humans, we make mistakes. Make them constantly, daily. If I can automate something, I'm less likely to make a mistake. And so, you know, going back to time saving is not just one piece, there's a lot that goes into that. And that's, that's one of the biggest ones is removing human error. Maybe you forgot a step. Maybe that checklist, you didn't print it out that day or you lost it, so you started a new checklist or whatever it was and you're, you're marking off your steps and you forgot one or, you know, somebody else did it. You can't guarantee, you know, I've heard, well, they checked off the step. Well, it doesn't mean they actually did it. So now I got to trust, but verify, right? Well, with automation, you remove that. It's, it's guaranteed because you wrote it to do it a certain way. Interesting. Well, <clears throat> we're, we're coming up to, uh, to two 30 here. Does, does anyone have any last questions before we wrap up? for our, our awesome panelists today. I'd say don't all speak up at once, but <laughs> you're not allowed to speak. <laughs> um, Quentin, do you have any, any final words that you'd like to leave people with? No, I, I mean, well, I think I talked a lot as it is, but- um... Yeah, you kind of did. <laughs> I like what we do. You know, I, I like the service that we're able to provide. I like this community. I think these, it, it gives us the opportunity to see how other folks are doing it. 
And well, the way I do it may not work for you. It may not work for Mike, it may not work for Zach, but we might find certain pieces that each other are doing that work for us as well. And so um, it's a good benefit to have this community. The biggest thing, like I said, is, is you know, going back earlier for you folks, whether it's just the Hyper-V or, or VMware or virtualization in general, just take a look, step a look, take a step back and take a look at the situation and evaluate it from the business objective. You know, this is centered around virtualization. Well, why do we always virtualize? Because of the business expectation that those, those servers are now portable, they're highly available, they're easier to back up, they're easier to migrate. Those all fall in line with business objectives. It's not just because we think some technology product is cool. The customer doesn't care how cool your technology product is. This allows us to align our cool technology products and the hype that we have behind it with their business objectives and virtualization is one big piece of that. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at these situations, really, really look at that. I've heard people say, you know, virtualizing one, one server is a waste of time. It's not, I promise you it's not. If you think that it is, you're doing something wrong and you're not evaluating your options and your tools that you have out there available to you. Worst case is I can pop a 30, 40 from their, one of their offices and throw that server on there to get them up and running if I need to in, in an emergency. That in and of itself right there was a benefit to the 15 extra minutes it took to install the Hyper-V role on their physical hardware and right click and hit new VM, you know? I mean, that right there is, is that should answer any question right there as to why we do what we do with virtualization. And, you know, one thing to understand about virtualization as well is that it needs to be used correctly. Yes. Um, I actually had a former employer, and I'm not employed there anymore, uh, be, where the the owner of the company came to my desk and said, I really hate this virtualization thing. We should have never done it. And, like, I honestly was speechless because, like, wow, right? And, well, let's put that in context. They had two very high-powered, like, 128-core uh, hosts, dual sockets, you know, just – like all of the RAM, like something like 196 gigs of RAM running, you know, 100 VMs on a storage sus subsystem that was two basic NAS boxes with 7,200 <laughs> RPM drives. On a RAID 5. Uh, uh, no, they were RAID 10, oh. they were, but they were 7,200 RPM drives, like Seagate Constellations or something like that. Uh, and like, guess what? The performance was absolutely horrid. And, you know, this guy was going on and on about how he spent so much money on these hosts. Uh, and like, why don't we have better performance? And like, you know, I was like, you need to spend about another 15,000 on storage. It wouldn't do it. Well, we can't afford that. We can't afford that. This should just work. And you can see why I don't work there anymore. 100, let me see, 100 VMs, you're going to be spending more than 15 grand on storage. Ah, yeah. Um, and like the, all the, like vast majority of them were Linux VMs mm. and like they actually worked well. Like MySQL databases, like they had like what could be argued as semi-decent performance for 15 people. And I don't know how, there was magic. Like maybe MySQL was caching a boatload of stuff in RAM. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, like it was, it was like, uh, I still have nightmares about that. I, ha I had disk latency of over 500 milliseconds on that storage subsystem. It was spin lock to the max. That's, that's one of the biggest things that I learned early on trying to do any kind of clustering or anything like that. You know, obviously you need uh, shared storage. Well, at the time you did, um, you needed some kind of shared storage. And <clears throat> one of the biggest reasons that they told people not to virtualize SQL was because nobody properly planned for their IOPS. No one ever did. Um, but then solid state started coming around or faster drives. People started realizing, hey, you know, I'm running SQL. Maybe I should listen to Microsoft run a RAID 10. Um, 
and, and it started coming around and that's why you see a lot more stuff now that's getting virtualized uh, when they said that it wasn't supposed to, but IOPS, that's the one. Everybody has has the, the common sense to look at processor, memory, disk space. Nobody looks at the disk speed, the performance of your storage. And that, that's, all, that's one mistake that uh, a lot of people will only make one time. You know, yeah, I uh, it could be said that virtualization lives and dies by storage speed. You know, I feel like there are some people that will continue to make that mistake over and over and over, and that's that's why they have a lot of former employees like Zach. I worked for an MSP that was very similar, and much like you, that's that's why I was not there. Uh, it was in between uh, bouncing between two enterprise environments. I took a short pit stop at an MSP and uh, um, uh, it was very similar. Their, their standard go-to, because it was a price-based conversation, was virtualized with 7,200 RPM drives on a RAID 5 for everything. That was the answer to everything. While then the techs hated virtualization, the customers hated virtualization, you know, and it was just, it was a mess. And you can't backpedal out of that. You can't fix that. The way to fix that is by spending more money. So, um, you know, I, I went there to be their CTO. They recruited me, I went there and that was just stuff that they were not gonna change as an MSP because they wanted to consistently be able to provide the cheapest solution so the customer wouldn't say no. And their answer to that was that exact implementation time and time again. Uh, also, the, the owner, you know, had a feeling that uh, nothing else besides RAID 5 mattered. Anything else is pointless because you couldn't expand them. My RAID 5, I can expand it all day long. You know, it's saying, well, there's, there's sacrifices to that. Um, but, yeah, it, it, sometimes it's not about the, the product. It's about the solution as a whole, which is the product and the service, you know, um, together. And that can truly affect the a way that the customer perceives something. Like Zach was saying, you know, they <laughs> they couldn't understand. They invested all this money, and why does virtualization suck so bad? Well, it wasn't the virtualization. They actually spent the right money in the right areas where they were told to. It sounds like those are heavy investments, but somebody proposed the wrong salute, the wrong product to meet the expectations, and now it they had a distaste for the entire solution. So it's not just Virtualization, sometimes it's it's the person implementing it too. All right. In, in my case, it's what led directly to my company. They hired me to build an MSP, and I did, and these are the kind of decisions they were making, and it eventually led to a come-to-Jesus conversation about, you are terrible at this, and you just need to stop. And so I talked them into it. They did and gave me their customer base. And here I am. Good for you. <clears throat> well, guys, uh, we are going to wrap up. Feel free to stick around for what, what I like to call the after party. Um, for those of you watching this on YouTube, sorry, you don't get the after party. Um, <clears throat> thanks everyone. Uh, next week we've got third wall joining us for a demonstration on their lab tech plugin. So, uh, feel free to hop on mspwebinars.com to learn more about that and to check out all of the pre-recorded webinars and all the bonus content. Uh, thank you so much to Mike, Zach, and Quentin, who I roped into this 30 seconds before we started. Uh, or maybe after we started, I'm still not sure. Uh, I appreciate all three of you guys. Wait, was I involved in this? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. You, you didn't say much. No. Um, I, I do. I, I appreciate all three of you guys, and I hope to have you three back on uh, again for another webinar. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. You all have a great day.